Good evening. I'm General Tony McPeak. I'm retired, uh, have been for a while, but for 37 years I was in, in the U.S. Air Force as a fighter pilot and ended up running the organization as the chief of staff. Now you're going to see tonight something about the air war in Korea. It was our first war as an independent air force, the first war fought by people wearing blue uniforms. Uh, and it was the first war of the jet age, uh, the F-86 against the uh, MiG-15. We learned an awful lot there because the MiG-15 was a better airplane in many ways. So you'll see some of that tonight, and I hope you enjoy it. Good luck and good flying. Korea was the first jet-on-jet -jet war in military history, but it was not the first time jets saw combat. Three planes, nine o'clock, coming around. The war in the skies over Nazi Germany in World War II was the largest air campaign in history. In the early days of the war, the German Luftwaffe ruled the skies. From the Atlantic to the Ural Mountains, from Norway to North Africa, German air power crushed its foes and made blitzkrieg by the Panzer forces possible. But by the fall of 1944, it was a different story. More than 100,000 Luftwaffe aircraft were lost between 1939 and 1944, while 320,000 pilots and air crew were killed and 230,000 seriously injured. Not only had Germany lost its air superiority, lost in all theaters by 1944, but many of the aircraft that remained in frontline squadrons were outclassed by their allied counterparts. Yet the fact remained that if the German command had exploited certain technological advantages its air force enjoyed, they might have made an appreciable difference in their military fortunes. On July 25, 1944, a British pilot reported that his Mosquito encountered an aircraft of incredible speed high over southern Germany. That aircraft was the Messerschmitt Me-262 turbojet known as the Schwalbe or Swallow. By April of 1944, the U.S. Army Air Force was sending streams of B-17s on bombing missions over Germany by day while the British sent their Lancasters over at night. At times, more than a thousand aircraft filled the sky. Escorting the B-17s were the long-range P-51 Mustang fighters. Sleek fighters that could roam deep into the skies over the Third Reich. Hermann Goering and his staff hoped that they would be able to deploy the ME-262 at just the right time to take on the deadly P-51s and put a serious hitch in the Allied strategic bombing campaign over Nazi Germany. German fighter ace and air defense chief Adolf Galland said that when he first flew an M262 jet fighter, it was like being pushed by angels. At about 100 miles per hour faster than any propeller-driven fighter, the jet was the defensive weapon Galland had been looking for, capable of penetrating any fighter cover that might be escorting the bombers. Hitler did not agree. Obsessed with the search for an offensive secret weapon to win the war, the Fuhrer insisted that the ME-262 be developed as a bomber. Against Hitler's wishes, 
A small number of ME-262 jet fighters were produced and sent to combat units. In addition to the standard fighter, the Germans produced the first night fighter jet, the ME-262B1A. Equipped with a long wavelength radar and superior homing gear, this machine became a deadly force in the hands of the right pilot. In fact, Luftwaffe Commando Kurt Welter became one of the first jet aces scoring 20 Allied kills, likely the highest number of kills by a jet pilot in history. When all was said and done, the ME-262A1A Schwalbe or Swallow emerged as an impressive war machine, but it was deployed in too few numbers and much too late to save the Luftwaffe and Germany. Great Britain emerged from World War II with a decided head start in jet technology. The Royal Air Force was the only Allied Air Force to have had a jet fighter operational in squadron strength before the German surrender on May 8, 1945. This was the Gloucester Meteor, which first flew on March 5, 1943. On July 21, 1944, the first two production meteors arrived at Combehead and formed the nucleus of number 616 Squadron RAF. Appropriately, the Meteor's first duty was to defend Britain from attacks by German V-1 pulse jet-powered guided bombs, of which they destroyed 13 by the end of the war. Meteor 3s of number 616 Squadron were committed to continental Europe in the last months of the conflict, but they never got the opportunity to meet the ME-262A in battle. A second wartime British fighter was the de Havilland DH-100 Vampire, whose design dated to 1941, but which did not become operational until 1946. Unlike the twin-engine Meteor, the Vampire had a single de Havilland Goblin II jet engine. Its tail surfaces consisted of a twin-boom arrangement similar to that of the American Lockheed P-38. On December 3, 1945, a naval version, the Sea Vampire, became the first pure jet aircraft to operate from an aircraft carrier. The United States was a relative newcomer to the jet age. Its emergence from World War II as the most powerful nation in the world and its need to prepare against a mounting Soviet threat spurred a mammoth American effort to develop jet aircraft. Although both American and Soviet jet designs were to get their greatest boost from the importation of British power plants and German swept wing technology, American designers, encouraged by generous financial support from their government, produced the most extensive and imaginative range of jet designs to fly during the 1940s. The United States entered the jet age on October 2, 1942, when the Bell XP-59 made its first test flight from Murak Dry Lake, now Edwards Air Force Base. Unfortunately, the new fighter's performance proved too disappointing for it to be committed to combat. Bell tried to improve the basic design with a more refined and more powerful twin-engine escort fighter, but the U.S. Army Air Forces had its eye on more promising designs that were waiting in the wings. One of those promising designs was the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star, which would live up to its name in the decade to follow. Designed by Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, William P. Ralston, and Don Palmer around a de Havilland HIB Goblin engine, the prototype XP-80 made its maiden flight on January 8, 1944, just 198 days after the U.S. AAF approved its construction. Production versions of this outstandingly clean fighter, powered by General Electric or Allison jet engines, would serve with distinction over Korea. In October 1947, the U.S. Army Air Forces became the U.S. Air Force, USAF. In mid-1948, this new separate branch of the U.S. military redesignated all P or pursuit aircraft as F fighters, so the P-80 became the F-80 shooting star. The most noticeable trend during the five years following World War II was the transition from straight wings to swept wings. As early as 1935, it was suggested that swept back wings would reduce drag at the sound barrier. The most successful jet fighter in the USAF during the late 1940s traced its origins to an unsuccessful Navy fighter. On November 27, 1946, the straight-wing North American XFJ-1 Fury made its maiden flight, but its performance was disappointing, and a Navy contract for 100 aircraft was reduced to 30. By that time, however, North American had learned of German swept-wing development 
and was already applying it to a lengthened, more streamlined version of the Fury with a 35 degree sweep to its wings. On October 7, 1947, test pilot George Welch took the XP-86 for its first flight, and on April 26, 1948, he broke the sound barrier in a dive. In June of that year, the P-86 became the F-86, and in March 1949, it was named the Sabre. With the added power of a GE J-47 engine, the F-86A jet became the best overall fighter of the 1950s, and started a line of Sabre variants that would ensure its place among the great fighter aircraft of all time. On November 24, 1947, the U.S. Navy first flew the most successful carrier-based fighter of the period, the Grumman F-9F2 Panther, which, like the USAF's F-84, later went on to acquire swept-back wings as the F-9F6 Cougar. On October 14, 1947, Air Force Captain Charles E. Yeager, flying in a rocket-powered Bell XS-1 research plane over Muroc Dry Lake, became the first man to officially pass through the sound barrier when he hit a speed of 700 miles per hour, Mach 1.06. Although great effort and sacrifice were expended to build a jet airplane capable of sustaining level flight above Mach 1 during the 1940s, it would not be attainable until late 1952. If any major power felt left behind at the onset of the jet age, it was the Soviet Union. The first turbojet-powered flight to be conducted in Soviet airspace was made on August 5, 1945, when Colonel Andrei G. Pochetkov test flew a captured Me-262 near Moscow. The first Soviet-designed team jet to fly was the MiG-9, which took off on April 24, 1946. The MiG-9 was a completely original design, a mid-wing monoplane with two BMW 003 jets mounted side by side. Similar in performance to the Gloucester Meteor, the MiG-9 had a better thrust-to-weight ratio, but higher wing loading. As had been the case with the Americans, British jet engines and German research into swept wing configuration radically accelerated Soviet jet development. In 1946, the British government allowed the export to the USSR of Rolls-Royce, Derwent, and Nene engines, as well as technical drawings, which the Russians promptly placed in licensed production as the RD-500 and RD-45, respectively. Renewed efforts were then made to take advantage of these new developments. With the British engine in hand, Mikoyan and Gerovich built an original swept-wing fighter around one of the imported British Nene's, the I-310, which first flew on December 17, 1947. Production using the RD-45 engine quickly followed under the designation of MiG-15. The MiG-15 was a distressing surprise to the West. The late 1940s had not yet established the definitive configuration for jet aircraft, but they had seen the genesis of its most fundamental elements. The decades to follow would see those fundamentals refined and expanded as man's quest to fly greater loads farther, higher, and faster applied itself to the jet age and the war in Korea. On June 25, 1950, North Korea invaded U.S. ally South Korea with seven infantry and one armored division, with the aim of reunifying the two countries under the communist flag. The North Korean advance was covered by Soviet-supplied LA-9 and Yak-7 piston engine fighters and IL-10 ground attack aircraft. These were mainly used to strafe South Korean airfields during the initial invasion. The tense standoff between the U.S. and the USSR, which had been the backdrop of world political affairs after World War II, was now a hot war. The response to this aggression was shaped by the United Nations Security Council and was led on the battlefield by the USA. The UN had proclaimed the North Korean attack a breach of world peace and requested member nations to assist the Republic of Korea. The government of the United States immediately sponsored a resolution in the United Nations to provide military aid to the embattled nation. 
Truman took this very, very seriously when he came in. And um, he was determined as he flew back to Washington that when he got to the Blair House, Dean Atchison had come up with some ideas of what he was going to do. And Dean Atchison uh, was determined that we have American citizens in South Korea and we're going to use our Air Force to take care of that. We're going to protect those people. We're not going to let these people be hurt. So can we use the American Air Force? And Truman said yes. The U.S. Air Force had gained independence as a service based on the idea that strategic bombing could win a war independently of ground and sea forces. Since the end of World War II, it had focused on preparing for nuclear war, and most of its meager funding had been directed toward this mission. When the Far East Air Force, FEAF, the U.S. Air Force's branch in Asia, was ordered to Korea, it was composed of aging aircraft and too few men to fly them. Air Force Chief of Staff Hoyt Vandenberg called FEAF the shoestring air force, and it found that because Korea was an agricultural nation with few industrial or military targets, strategic bombing would not affect the war. Other types of missions, often requiring close coordination with land or sea forces, were required. At the end of the war, only 0.2% of all missions flown were strategic bombing. In contrast, almost half consisted of ground interdiction or tactical bombing. Unfortunately, the only aircraft immediately available in the theater for the tactical role were a small number of F-80C Shooting Star jet fighter bombers and some obsolescent North American F-82 twin Mustang piston engine fighters. This limited air force covered a civilian evacuation in the wake of the invasion before the deployment of ground forces from 17 nations could arrive. The initial aim of this force was to push the communist forces out of South Korea and back across the 38th parallel. As North Korean forces pressed toward the South Korean capital of Seoul, U.S. air power went into action. The first into battle was the F-80 Shooting Stars. Initial air support for the ground troops was provided by the F-80 fighter bombers as well as U.S. Marine Corps F-7F Tiger Cat night fighters. Anyway, yeah, the, the uh, Lockheed F-80, P-80 was a uh, jet and therefore was capable of jet speeds and jet altitudes, and that was its big advantage. I mean, it could cruise at uh, 500 miles an hour and not 400 or 350 like the propeller-driven uh, aircraft and uh, at high altitude. But it did not accelerate very well. It was, this, you know, when you released the brakes on takeoff, it didn't have an afterburner, so you had this rather slow <laughs> acceleration, which was a real surprise for the P-51 pilots who were used to, you know, you push the power forward on that P-51 and uh, it would put your pressure back against the seat on takeoff. The Tiger Cats were flown from their bases in Japan and equipped with long-range fuel tanks. Without these planes, the meager UN forces would have easily been pushed into the sea. Air interdiction was the key in those early days of the conflict, especially as there were very few roads or railroads leading from the north to the south. The raids by the F-80s and F-7Fs focused on NKPA supply routes to stop the flow of reinforcements and supplies. Close air support, the, the North Korean Air Force didn't amount to much. It was gone quickly. Uh, after the Chinese entered the war, then we had to fight with the Chinese and Russians. And uh, not much was written about or, or said about the Russians who we fought in Korea. But uh, one of them was the leading ace on both sides. You know, he claimed like 30 kills or something like that. I have to look up his name. But uh, the Russian Air Force produced more aces in Korea than we did in the post-war era when we got a hold of the records and read all about this. It was quite interesting that we were actually fighting Russian pilots, Russians and Chinese. So by the time the Russians and Chinese got involved, we were out the other side of the P-80 period. I mean, I know a guy who actually has a MiG kill in a P-80, F-80. But uh, not very many. The, the, most of the air combat was F-86s versus MiG-15. In the beginning, NKPA tanks were particularly easy to find as they were not escorted by anti-aircraft guns. When the tanks traveled at night, they left their headlights on. The interdiction effort was successful. 
NKPA fuel tanks on the front lines went empty and troop rations were reduced from rice, fish, meat and vegetables to merely rice. When the chief of staff of NKPA's 13th Infantry was captured in September 1950, he testified that half of our personnel had lost the stamina necessary to fight in mountainous terrain because of these air attacks on their supply lines. On June 27, the first jet fighter combat by American fighters occurred when four F-80Cs shot down four NKAF IL-10s, while elsewhere F-82Gs destroyed three Yak-9s. Though U.S. air units were rushing to Korea, by June 29, Seoul was in communist hands and U.S. ground forces fighting with the Korean army were in disarray. By the beginning of July, F-51 Mustangs and Navy Corsairs took over the ground support role. Armed with rockets and flown by U.S., South African, and Australian pilots, they proved excellent in this ground attack role. On July 2, 1950, Number 77 Squadron, a Royal Australian Air Force fighter squadron, was committed to action over Korea as part of the United Nations forces and flew its first ground attack sorties the same day, making it the first non-United States UN unit to see action. At the same time, the F-80s were assigned to the air combat role on occasions of penetration by the North Korean Air Force. In October, 77 Squadron supported the UN advance into North Korea but was withdrawn to Pusan in November in response to the Communist forces counterattack. The squadron was then withdrawn to Japan in April 1951 to re-equip with Gloucester Meteor jet fighters and return to action with these new aircraft in July. The re-equipped squadron moved to Kempo in June 1951 and was declared combat ready the following month. There was some apprehension as the F-8 was clearly inferior in most respects to the Communist forces MiG-15 just starting to appear over Korea and was superior to the F-86 Sabre only in rate of climb and in acceleration. Number 77 Squadron first flew meteors in a combat mission on July 30, 1951. The squadron had mainly been trained in the ground attack role and had difficulties when assigned to bomber escort duty at sub-optimum altitudes. As a result, bomber escort role was taken over by the USAF and 77 Squadron returned to ground attack duties. The Meteor performed well but proved vulnerable to ground fire and losses were high. Monday morning, July 3, 1950, the Korean War was just 10 days old. On the Yellow Sea, 180 miles southwest of Incheon, South Korea, the USS Carrier Valley Forge steamed north at high speed toward the 38th parallel. At 9.35 hours, she began launching aircraft. Jet engines began winding up from a high-pitched scream to a thunderous roar, and one by one the catapult shot them forward and off the deck, clawing for altitude. The third aircraft away was flown by Lieutenant Leonard Flogg. The fourth was his wingman, Ensign E.W. Brown. Two hours and 20 minutes later, the pair was over Pyongyang, North Korea, in their Grumman Panthers. Their mission was to ride shotgun for various Allied piston engine craft, which were sent to wreak havoc on the enemy airfield located there. Spying a pair of Russian-built Yak-9 piston engine craft taking off from one of the airfields under attack, Plog and Brown nosed over to challenge them. Plog pulled up on the tail of one Yak only to discover tracers flying past him from another enemy at six. Pulling back hard on the stick, he was relieved to see the tracers falling away from him as Brown slid neatly astern of the antagonist. He squeezed the trigger and put a stream of 20 millimeter cannon shells across the yak from the top of the fuselage just beyond the canopy to about midway out on the left wing. There was a terrible explosion and the yak disintegrated before his eyes. Pieces of the yak nine were scattered over a large area of the frosty Korean landscape. It was the very first kill by a Grumman Panther. The sleek Panther would soon be performing almost half of all attack missions for the Navy and the Marine Corps.
Sure, I think they were called F-6. They're jets. They flew uh, flew jets. Uh, bomber fighters, small. They carried, I think, two bombs, and uh, they go out on a run, bomb whatever they're supposed to, and then look for somebody to shoot at on the way home. Every once in a while, a guy would come back and zip over the base because he'd made a kill on the way home. A Marine airfield was a busy place. As fast as American industry could build them, Devil Dog's air power was sent to Korea. Mostly those Panther jets, uh, not, our, not on, of our own, but sometimes they had uh, C-130s come in the, the flying boxcar and uh, different types of propeller planes that didn't belong to our company. They had a place that you could cross the runway if you wanted to. And I never tried to use it but once or twice. I decided to take a shortcut one day across the runway. And you stop at near the edge and look up in the tower and if they flash a green light, you can go across. Flash red light, of course, you wait. So I pulled up there and I had gas in my truck and uh, I looked up in the tower and they flashed me a red light. So I sat there and waited. I looked out in the sky. There's a flying bucks car coming in. And he came on down and about the time he touched the ground, he went a little bit crooked. Started toward me. And I thought, well, am I going to get out of here and run or am I going to put this thing in reverse? I don't know what I was going to do, but just real quick, he got her, he gave her a little jerk and straightened it out. So I didn't have anything to worry about. In a minute, they flashed me a green light, and I drove on across. The F-9F Panther brought the jet age to the U.S. Navy. Although not the Navy's first carrier jet, it was the first carrier-based jet fighter to see combat. Extensively used on ground attack duties in Korea, the Panther was a fine warplane in the hands of a trained pilot. Its structural strength, the trademark of the Grumman Iron Works, helped Marines enormously as they flew Panthers through gunfire to attack ground troops in Korea. In spite of the fact that a Panther gained the U.S. Navy's first jet kill, a MiG-15 in late November 1950, the F-9F was seriously outclassed by the swept wing F-86 Sabre and the MiG-15, which were then beginning to enter into service. But for the naval aviators and Marines who flew her, she was the right aircraft at the right time. Finally, the communist offensive was halted as much by exhaustion among the communist forces as by the relentless air attacks on their supply lines. Growing UN air superiority was to be the key to the entire war. Resupplied and tired of running, it was now time for the UN forces in Korea to strike back. Supreme UN Commander General MacArthur's counterattack combined a breakout from the Pusan perimeter with a brilliant amphibious landing at Incheon. Hammered by tanks, artillery, and fighter bombers, the North Koreans retreated in disarray. In five days of textbook-style campaigning, the 8th Army broke out of Pusan and closed on the approaches of Seoul, the South Korean capital. By the end of September, the North Korean Army had essentially ceased to exist, and UN forces were within five miles of the 38th parallel all along the line. Pounded from the ground and air, the once powerful NKP Army fell back in chaos. UN air power patrolled the sky at will. The UN forces rapidly advanced north toward the Chosin Reservoir, the site of an important hydroelectric plant, and the Yalu River, the border between North Korea and the People's Republic of China. Despite intelligence information in early November that revealed Chinese Communist forces were massing in strength across the Yalu River, MacArthur ordered UN forces to continue their pursuit of the North Koreans. On November 27th, elements of the Chinese Communist People's Liberation Army crossed the Yalu River and struck UN positions in force. In a carefully planned counterstroke, eight Chinese divisions charged down from surrounding mountains with the express mission of destroying the advancing 8th Army. As the Chinese poured across the border into Korea, Chinese air power suddenly entered the war in a dangerous way. During the first two months of the war, the combat aircraft was mostly of World War II era, 
Mustangs were used in the ground attack role. U.S. Navy and Marine Corsairs operated from carriers. Strategic bombing missions were conducted by B-26 medium bombers and B-29 superforts, bombers escorted by F-80 shooting star jets that were almost as old. In the absence of any serious opposition, these well-trained combat aircraft ruled the skies. But when China entered the conflict, that all changed. In the steel gray skies over North Korea, the first Russian-built swept-wing MiG-15, codename Faggot, appeared. It was one of the most advanced jet fighters of the day. The MiG-15 was primarily intended as an interceptor, produced to protect the Soviet Union from the threat of fleets of American bombers flying into Soviet airspace at high altitude. The designers therefore created an aircraft with a service ceiling of about 51,000 feet and a rate of climb of 9,000 feet per minute. The fast, heavily armed MiG outflew first-generation UN jets, such as the American F-80 and Australian and British Gloucester Meteors, posing a real threat to B-29 Super Fortress bombers, even under fighter escort. When the Chinese surprised us, our intelligence set up, and certainly MacArthur, uh, by intervening and driving us back towards the 49th parallel. So, uh, but no, after that, the, the, you know, we, we should sure, you know, had to expect the Chinese were gonna operate out of bases in Manchuria. Chinese and Russians eventually would operate out of those bases. They're certainly never gonna operate out of Korean bases because we closed all those bases very quickly, and North Korean bases. So it had to be uh, China and Chinese support that was, uh, that was a factor. There was really no surprise. As for the equipment, you know, the hardware, the MiG-15, no, we knew that's what they were gonna use. So I, I wouldn't say that was a surprise. It was a little bit of a surprise how good the airplane was because it outperformed the F-86 in many ways, almost always, in fact. It cruised higher, uh, accelerated faster, was light, very maneuverable. Its principal defect was, uh, well, or a couple. One was in its gunnery systems and aiming systems, which were very primitive. It had a large gun, I think it was a 37 caliber cannon, and a couple of smaller ones, 23s, I think. But they were slow firing. So, I mean, you had to really track the target for a long time in order to score hits with it. But if they hit, I mean, it blew a hole in whatever it hit. It had been designed to shoot down B-29s. It was an air defense aircraft for the Russians. So, you know, it had to ha pack a punch to, to knock down a big airplane. By, by contrast, you know, we still had 50 caliber machine guns, which is what we were using. We had no cannon whatsoever on those uh, F-86s, machine guns. Uh, but, and, and their aiming systems were primitive, of kind of iron sight World War II technology. Their other big disadvantage was they, in roll rate, they couldn't turn the aircraft quickly, roll it quickly to establish a new turn vector. So if you were in a uh, 1v1 fight with somebody, you know, the F-86 was very agile. It could turn quickly and spoil this guy. If, if he eventually had a, a aiming solution, a tracking solution that would allow him to score hits, you know, we could quickly reposition and, and destroy his tracking position. So this made it very difficult for the MiG-15 to score kills. Air superiority is a bedrock principle of American war fighting. This is still as true today as it was in World War II and Korea. Air superiority is essential for offensive infantry operations or defensively when being attacked by a superior force, as well as for conducting a strategic air campaign. The MiG-15 represented the first serious threat to American air superiority since the dark days of 1942 and 1943, during which the U.S. lacked a realistic ability to protect the bomber streams over Europe. The MiG-15 was designed to be a bomber killer, pure and simple. The Soviet Air Force sent their best pilots to fly missions for the North Koreans to gain experience against the West and learn their aerial combat techniques. The decision to introduce the MiG-15 not only closed the jet fighter gap, its performance leapfrogged all of the opposing straight-wing jets. U.S. pilots in Korea were astonished to find that the MiG-15 had an advantage over the new Sabres of about 3,000 feet per minute and a climb. 
Furthermore, the MiG-15 could operate at altitudes that the Sabre simply could not reach. The MiG-15s proved very effective in its designed role against formations of V-29 heavy bombers, shooting down numerous aircraft. When a North Korean pilot defected with a MiG-15 in 1953, no less a person than Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier, was flown out to Japan to look it over. He found nothing revolutionary, just a tough, agile, and well-designed aircraft with a suitably powerful engine. In 1950, the F-86 was under development, but was not battle ready. The best American fighter jet available at the time was the F-80. It was a good aircraft on paper, but no match for the MiG-15s. The MiGs were like lightning. At first, the MiG-15 pilots simply flew along the Yellow River in an effort to tempt American aircraft into Chinese airspace. But on November 8th, a section of four of the communist jets ventured too far and was boxed in by four F-80s and into the first all-jet air combat in history. On the following day, a U.S. Navy F-9F Panther pilot flying off the deck of the USS Philippine Sea also downed a Chinese MiG. But the combat was not all one way. On November 10th, Chinese jets shot down a B-29 heavy bomber. The MiG was now seriously threatening to deny the UN the air superiority they had previously enjoyed. In December 1950, the United States sent in the F-84 Thunder Jet an escort fighter, and at long last, its latest fighter, the F-86 Sabre, to take on the MiGs. The Thunder Jet had a distinguished record during the Korean conflict. Although the F-84B and the F-84C could not be deployed because their J-35 engines had a service life of only 40 hours, the F-84D and F-84E entered combat with the 27th Fighter Escort Group on December 7, 1950. The aircraft were initially tasked with escorting the B-29 bombers. The first Thunder Jet air-to-air -air victory against a MiG-15 was scored on January 21, 1951, at the cost of two F-84s. The F-84 was a generation behind the swept-wing Soviet MiG-15 and outmatched, especially when the MiGs were flown by Soviet pilots, and the MiG counter-air mission was soon given to the F-86 Sabre. Like its famous predecessor, the P-47, the F-84 switched to the low-level interdiction role at which it excelled. The F-84 flew a total of 86,408 missions, dropping 55,586 tons of bombs and 6,129 tons of napalm. The USAF claimed F-84s were responsible for 60% of all ground targets destroyed in the war. Notable F-84 operations included the 1952 attack on the Suiho Dam. During the war, the F-84 became the first USAF fighter to utilize aerial refueling, which allowed them to linger over targets much longer. In aerial combat, F-84 pilots were credited with eight MiG-15 kills against the loss of 64 Soviet-built aircraft. In mid-December 1950, the Korean front stabilized near the 38th parallel, and the Sabre-equipped 4th Fighter Interceptor Wing arrived at Kempo Airfields outside Seoul. The Sabre represented many firsts in technology and design. Swept wing configuration had become a standard for jet-powered aircraft. The then revolutionary but now commonplace flying tail allows the aircraft excellent maneuverability at high altitudes. In addition, the Sabre employs a hydraulic system for the movement of the flight controls, eliminating the excessive control stick forces necessary to maneuver other types of airplanes at high speeds. Identifying features of the F-86 are the graceful swept-back wing and the nose inlet located in the fuselage. Armament of the fighter versions of the aircraft consisted of three 50 caliber machine guns buried in each side of the fuselage near the nose and provisions for carrying two 1,000-pound bombs or 16 5-inch rockets on the wings. Interceptor versions of the aircraft carried 24 2.75-inch rockets mounted on a retractable tray contained in the bottom of the fuselage. The tray extended only long enough to launch the rockets. 
outnumbered four to one, the F-86 proved their worth. Although the numbers were not large, many of the newly arrived American fighter pilots were World War II veterans with considerable flying and combat experience, whereas U.S. intelligence had revealed that the North Korean and Chinese pilots were much younger and lacked such combat experience. Now, the Air Force then had to grow, had to expand very rapidly in order to meet the demands of the Korean War, and many of these World War II guys were brought back in. But they were not, you know, regular officers. They had been reservists in World War II, most of them, and uh, might have stayed on as uh, active reserve back in their civilian communities or Air National Guard people, but they were recalled uh, to active duty. And they did carry the load because the majority fell into that, that category. Among these old timers were baseball player Ted Williams, future TV sidekick Ed McMahon, and future astronaut John Glenn. One of the most successful of these retreads was Francis Gabby Gabreski, one of only seven pilots to achieve ace status both in World War II and the Korean War. In 1940, he applied to join the Army Air Corps, but, awkward and nervous, was almost washed out of flight school. Sent to fight in Europe, he flew with a Polish squadron of the RAF before becoming a member of the USAF's 56 fighter group. Flying P-47 Thunderbolts, he recorded 28 kills before being shot down and taken as a prisoner of war in the summer of 1944. Gabreski was in his 30s when the Korean War gave him a second chance at air combat. Leading the 51st Fighter Interceptor Wing, he was credited with shooting down six and a half MiGs. Like many pilots who had fought in World War II, Gabreski disdained newfangled technology such as radar-controlled gun sights. An inveterate gum chewer, he would pick some gum out of his mouth as he entered combat and stick it to his saber's windshield to line up his shot. His natural ability never let him down. There were strange echoes of World War I in the Korean conflict. As on the Western Front during the Great War, the most important function of air power was to support ground troops engaged in a grim and desperate war of attrition. But once again, it was the fighter pilots and their contest for air superiority that grabbed the headlines. The duel between MiG-15s and Sabres in MiG Alley over the Yalu achieved legendary status as a classic of aerial combat, even while the fighting was still in progress. It was the setting for the first all-jet air war. The MiG pilots generally operated in formations up to more than 50 strong. The far less numerous Sabre pilots were aggressive, eager for action, and intensely competitive. Not since World War I had the pursuit of ace status, five kills had such importance. The fighting in MiG Alley was a study in contrasting tactics and styles of warfare. The great strength of the MiG-15s was their performance at high altitude. Cruising at 48,000 feet and at just below Mach 1, the MiG was unreachable by the Sabres. If they stayed at that kind of altitude, as they often did, the Sabres were denied the possibility of air combat. When the MiG pilots were more aggressively inclined, a number of them would peel away from the mass formation and dive on the Sabres patrolling far below. They would try to get in a shot at the Americans before pulling back up, using their superior rate of climb to escape. These tactics were known to the American pilots as yo-yo, or when the MiGs came out of the sun and climbed back towards it again as zoom and sun. The Sabre pilots had an aircraft that was faster than the MiG in level flight and more effective at lower altitudes. If they could engage the MiGs in a dogfight, they had a high chance of success. One effective tactic was dubbed jet stream. 16 Sabres would enter MiG alley in flights of four at a few minutes interval. If the MiG could be tempted to dive on one of the flights, the others would converge to counterattack. The Sabres operated at a significant disadvantage in that they were always far from their bases and even with drop tanks, they never had more than 20 minutes in the battle zone. The MiGs mostly remained within a few minutes flying time of their bases over the Chinese border. The Sabres were constantly outnumbered, usually by three or four to one, yet they had far better results than the air duels. The crucial factor was pilot quality. Most communist flyers were good at following instructions but showed little initiative or aggression and often made basic errors in dogfights. The American pilots displayed an outstanding hunger for battle. They had the right stuff, and this proved decisive.
In January 1951, the United Nations ground forces mounted a counterattack from their line of their furthest withdrawals. They pounded their way from below the 38th parallel and through the Iron Triangle. In support of the ground forces were the Marines and their F-9F Panthers. But the Marine Corps is really the only service that is totally self-supporting. We have our ground troops. We have our helicopters to get them in and get them out. We have our jets that provide close air support and uh, make strategic strikes. And um, we don't have to really, well, I guess we rely on the Navy to get us there to, to venues where we need to be. But we, we basically support our own. Close air support by F-9F Panther jets brought in a new discipline which took into account the aircraft's high speed and reduced range. There was also concern about the Panther's shallower dive angle because of the jet's higher speed. This reduced angle increased the fighter's exposure to its own bomb fragments after delivery. From the Navy and Marine Corps standpoint, air-to-air -air action was sporadic, with the Air Force seeing most of the engagements against communist aircraft. At first, the enemy seemed reluctant to commit its few modern MiG-15 fighters and sent in World War II veterans like Yak-9 fighters and IL-10 ground attack bombers. Corsair pilot captain Philip C. DeLong shot down two Yaks on April 21, 1951, while his wingman, First Lieutenant Harold Dye, accounted for two others. DeLong was already an ace in the Pacific with 11 Japanese kills. The communists also increased their force of MiG-15s by activating a second regiment equipped with the improved MiG-15 BIs. At once the tempo of air combat increased and formations of 80 enemy jets were frequently sighted. One of the war's biggest single combats was fought on October 22, 1951 as eight B-29s escorted by 55 F-84s and 35 F-86s were bombing Nam Si. Suddenly, 100 MiGs appeared and boxed in the escorts as 50 other MiGs made for the bombers. They managed to shoot down three of the bombers and severely damaged four others. Six MiGs were shot down and one F-84 was lost. As the spring and early summer of 1953 proceeded, the Marine squadrons kept up the pressure, flying countless sorties against enemy lines and installations. Sometimes their attention made the difference between a communist victory and an outpost remaining in Marine hands. The attack on the Suiho Dam was the collective name for a large series of air attacks by UN Command Air Forces on 13 hydroelectric generating facilities that took place between June 23rd and June 24th, 1952. Primarily targeting the hydroelectric complex associated with the Suiho Dam in North Korea, the attacks were intended to apply political pressure on the stalled truce negotiations at Panmunjom. The air assault was conducted jointly by fighters and fighter bombers of the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, U.S. Marines, and the South African Air Force. This was the first time the separate air arms had worked together on such a massive scale. It was followed 17 days later by another series of large-scale joint attacks on the capital city of Pyongyang. Four attacks on a much more limited scale occurred between September 12, 1952 and June 7, 1953 causing only minor damage and little impact on the outcome of the truce talks. UN forces also exerted pressure on the North Korean infrastructure by attacking the smaller power generating plants of the North Korean power grid during the summer of 1952 to prevent them from filling the void in power generation. Aircraft from all three services were a mixture of propeller driven and jet aircraft. 84 F-86 Sabres of the 4th and 51st Fighter Interceptor Wings were the first to arrive in the Suiho target area to provide cover against the MiG attack. The MiG-15 fighter base complex at Antong Tai Tong Chao in China, where 150 MiGs had been counted, was located less than 40 miles from the UN target. Part of the force was ordered to keep MiGs from taking off by flying low over their bases, even though officially UN aircraft were not allowed to cross the Yalu except in hot pursuit. According to U.S. sources, 160 MiGs took off before the arrival of the covering force flew deeper into China, possibly fearing the airfields were the targets and none attempted to intercept the strike force. 
nicknamed Maple Special, incursions into Manchuria by pilots of the 51st FIW were planned to surprise MiGs over their own airfields and to establish contrived conditions for hot pursuit. These missions had resulted in heavy losses for the 64th IAK during the previous months. At least half of the MiGs destroyed in April and May 1952 were shot down during takeoffs or landings in response to the American ruse. 12 AD Sky Raiders, or VA-65, off the Boxer, then began their dive bombing runs on the Suiho generating stations, followed by 23 Sky Raiders off the Princeton and Philippine Sea, releasing 81 tons of bombs in little more than two minutes. Between 1610 and 1700, U.S. Air Force jets added 145 tons of bombs on the Suiho generating plant. At almost the same time, 52 F-51 Mustangs of the 18th Fighter Bomber Group and the South African 2nd Squadron struck Fusen plants 3 and 4 west of Hung Nam, while 40 Marine Sky Raiders and Corsairs of MAG-12 bombed Choshin No. 4 and 38 Panthers of MAG-33 hit Choshin No. 3. The lower Fusen plants in the Kyosen complex were bombed by 102 Corsairs, 18 Sky Raiders and 18 Panthers off the carriers. In all, on June 23rd, Task Force 77 flew 208 strike sorties and the FEAF 202. Most of the targets were restruck the next day, June 24th, in both morning and afternoon missions. I know in those years, 52 and 53, we did attack uh, water systems. Uh, the ones I know about more than along the Yalu River were in central North uh, Korea, uh, where we flooded the rice paddies and destroyed, essentially destroyed the agriculture. When I say we killed millions of North Koreans, most of them starved to death. They weren't bombed to death, but we, we managed to destroy the agricultural infrastructure in North Korea. That's what I say they haven't fully recovered from. Approximately 90% of North Korea's power production capacity was destroyed in the attacks with 11 of the 13 generating plants put totally out of operation and the remaining two doubtful of operating. For two weeks, North Korea endured a total power blackout. Combat information from Korea was filtered back to the Sabre's designers, and in June 1952, an improved Sabre, the F-86F, began to be deployed to the 51st Fighter Wing. The F-86F was the first Sabre variant which was superior in all respects to the MiG-15s. During the last six months of the war, these fighters wholly dominated the skies. By June, the Reds were ready for an armistice. The battle line of mid-June was to remain more or less stabilized throughout the coming peace talks. Finally, notice was received that July 27th would be the last day of the war. Even as the 7,000 men of the first MAW prepared to stand down, the Wing's aircraft flew 222 sorties on that day. Captain William I. Armogost of VMF 311 flew the last jet mission of the war against Chinese supply areas in the late afternoon, 35 minutes before the ceasefire was to take effect at 1910 hours. During the war, the UN forces downed 827 MiGs. The UN forces lost 112 jet aircraft. It was one of the most successful air campaigns ever. After the war, the USAF reported an F-86 Sabre kill ratio in excess of 10 to 1, with 792 MiG-15s and 108 other aircraft shot down by Sabres, and 78 Sabres lost to enemy fire. Post-war data, however, confirms only 379 Sabre kills. 39 UN pilots became aces. The Soviet Air Force reported some 1,100 air-to-air -air victories and 335 MiG combat losses. China's People's Liberation Army Air Force, PLAAF, reported 231 combat losses, mostly MiG-15s and 168 other aircraft lost. The KPAF reported no data, but the UN command estimates some 200 KPAF aircraft lost in the war's first stage and 70 additional aircraft after the Chinese intervention. 
The USAF disputes Soviet and Chinese claims of 650 and 211 downed F-86s, respectively, as more recent U.S. figures state 230 losses out of 674 F-86s deployed to Korea. The differing tactical roles of the F-86 and the MiG-15 may have contributed to the disparity in losses. MiG-15s primarily targeted B-29 bombers and ground attack fighter bombers, while F-86s targeted the MiGs. In the context of Korea, the initial deployment of the MiG-15 threatened the ability of the U.S. to conduct a strategic air campaign. Without the deployment of the F-86, the U.S. would not have had an interceptor capable of countering the MiG and protecting the bombers. In Korea, the strategic air campaign was not that important. There weren't that many targets to hit. In the ground attack role, which was far more important in Korea, the U.S. already had superior aircraft types. The strategic air campaign that was conducted, much like in Vietnam a generation later, was designed to force the Chinese and the NK to the negotiating table. This would have eventually happened regardless of the effectiveness of a strategic air campaign. Neither China nor the U.S. wanted to get bogged down in a never-ending Korean War. Once it became clear that the Korean War was not a precursor to the U.S.-led invasion of China and that the Chinese were prepared to accept a restoration of the pre-war boundaries, neither side had much interest in prolonging the war. The larger implication of the deployment of the MiG-15 went beyond the borders of Korea. It touched the very core of the American doctrine of nuclear deterrence. The U.S. relied on its bomber fleet and its effectiveness in delivering their nuclear payloads to contain Soviet expansion, especially in Europe. Had the perceived effectiveness of the American deterrent been eroded, the U.S. would have either had to build up its conventional forces in Europe to more effectively check Soviet military power or accepted more Soviet adventurism. Without a credible nuclear deterrent, Europe might have faced a never-ending stream of Berlin-type crises. The F-86 Sabre and Super Sabre proved the MiG-15 could be handled and the bombers could get through to their assigned targets. From an air combat viewpoint, the Korean War was historic in that it was the first major conflict in which large numbers of opposing jet fighters engaged one another. For future air-to-air -air combat, the Korean War marked the end of the age of gun-only armament air combat. The era of the air-to-air -air missile was about to dawn. The second generation of jet fighters which fought in the skies over Korea wrote a new chapter in aviation history and became legends of air combat.